Amen. Let's prepare our hearts for communion. Communion is a time when we remember what Jesus has done in our lives. Communion is a time when we remember not only what he has done for us, but what he has done in us. Communion is to remember what Christ went through and to remember what he asked us to go through. Communion is therefore a reflection of our relationship with our God. You remember what we have been saying all these weeks? That what marks us as different from the rest of the world? If you see somebody like Pastor Frank Cheung and you say, wow, what a life. And you look at what a life. What is the difference between that life and another life? And very clearly you see that the difference is because he has a relationship with his God. You can see in his life that whatever happens, there is God as part of his life. There is God in the forefront of his thoughts. There is God in the forefront of what he says, what he does, and what he did. A relationship with God. He lived his life passionately for God. Some of us live our life very passionately for other things. Some of you I know are very passionate about cars. And so everything you do, you say, you, it's, it's about cars. Some of you are passionate about football, about, you know, Gaelic games. So everything, you, you know, you wear the shirts and you watch the teams and you, you, know, you follow the progress of each of the groups. You're passionate about that. Your life reflects it. You can see it. People can see it. People can look at you coming in, driving the car and say, wow, I can tell that this person is passionate about cars. People see you wearing your shirt and your scarves and say, wow, this person is passionate about the team, about football. That passion is visible. That passion is not hidden. Because if it is hidden, I hardly call it passion. Because it doesn't overwhelm, doesn't consume your life. For us as Christians, God has called us to have a relationship with him, this relationship to be supreme to everything else in our lives. This relationship shows the rest of the world our closeness with God, our passion. How passionate are you with your relationship with God? Why are we not passionate? Why are we so cool and unemotional about being a Christian? Okay. I do not accept that some of us argue that, you know, as young people, the young people of today's generation are cool. Non That's not true because you have your passion. You show your passion in other things. Why are we not showing our passion about our relationship with God? Why we have no passion when we worship? You have passion when you go to the clubs, when you're dancing on the dance floor, and sometimes you dance to the dance floor, dance to the music, when you don't even know what the lyric is about. Yeah. But yet when we worship God, we have no passion. It doesn't influence. Our body don't move. Our hands don't get raised. There's no facial expression. Okay. No passion. Why is there no passion for us to change our lives? Why do we not sit here and say, gee, I know my life is in a mess. Gee, I don't like the way my life is at the moment. I really, really, really want. Now, some of you have passion about your studies and say, I really, really, really want to go into that course. And you don't get enough points this year and say, I'm not going to accept another course. I'm going to do it again because I want to go on that course. We have, no pa we have passion for that, but we have no passion for becoming a better person. We don't turn around and say, gee, I don't like the way I am. Let me try again. Let me start again tomorrow and become the person that I ought to become. No passion. Okay. Why have we no passion? And really, I think sometimes we excuse ourselves, we, we deceive ourselves even, and, and, and we deceive other people. We say, well, I do have passion, it's just that it doesn't show. Okay? If you have passion, it will show. 
And when we don't show, then we have to question what is the extent of our desire and of our passion for God. And that is a great challenge for us. Don't be deceived and to say that, yeah, I have passion, it's just I don't show. When you have passion, you cannot help but to show it. It may not be that you're grinning face to face all the time and bouncing up and down all the time, that kind of passion. It may not be that kind of passion to show, but it will show through in your life. It will show through in your commitment. It will show, show through in the way you live your life, the things that you want to do, the places that you want to go, the tasks that you want to accomplish, the dreams that you have, the directions of your life. Those things will show through. So I'm not, don't mistake me, I'm not talking about the fact that you know, we ought, every one of us ought to be bouncing up and down and jumping up and down and raising hands and screaming your, your voice out loud. But whatever way we express, our life needs to express passion for God, for our relationship. <clears throat> How do we describe that? It is actually very simple. Okay, let's look at one single verse. Romans chapter 12, verse 9. What do we see that? Romans chapter 12, verse 9. Okay. Just very simple. It's just that love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Such a simple verse that even we teach Sunday school children, little kids, remember this. Hate what is evil, love what is good. Okay. But yet, that is the first step of our passion for God. Follow me, right? Listen to this. This is our first step. We sometimes realize that we do not have passion for something, it's because we do not love it enough. Sometimes we do not have passions to get rid of certain things, it's because we do not hate it enough. We have to really ask ourselves, do we cling to what is good? Not just hold it with two fingers, we cling. Use the word, see that word? We held tight, we cling to what is good, and not just avoid evil, we hate evil. See, those words are powerful words. You cling to what is good, and you hate what is evil. So those are two things that we want to think about this morning. First thing, do we have passion in our life because we hate our old life of sin. We hate our lives with our God. Do we hate that? Do we hate sin? You don't hate it enough, you won't let go of it. Do you love God? Do you really appreciate? Are you grateful for the life that God has given you? If you are sitting here as a Christian and you say, gee, it doesn't matter, there's no passion, right? Because it doesn't matter. But if you sit there and say, I absolutely hate the life of sin. Wow, that's passion. I, I was so grateful, so thankful for salvation, for the life of God. That's passion. Are you sitting there? When, you know, doesn't matter. If you sitting there saying, doesn't matter. That is apathy. That's not passion. Does it matter to you? Okay? So it's a question I asked you this morning before you come to communion. Does it matter to you that you have sin in your life? Does it repulse you? Do you absolutely find it distasteful? Do you run away from it? Do you, on the other hand, love God, desire for God, desire for this new life, grateful for this new life? Let me, let me give you an example. You know, some of you know that, you know, everybody wants me to go on a diet. Yeah? Because my tummy is getting big and I'm getting heavy. And they don't want me to eat so much. You know why dieting is so difficult? Well, dieting is so difficult. Okay. You know, if I, give you, if I give all of you a diet demand, I say from today onwards, okay, you are not allowed to eat worms. You're not allowed to eat worms. Do you think you have a problem keeping to that diet? 
Do you struggle with that diet? Of course you won't. Why? Because you hate eating worms. You don't like eating worms. Because the mere thought of you swallowing a worm makes you sick. You have no problem. But on the other hand, if I say, let me command every of you to have a diet, not allowed to eat sweets, not allowed to eat chocolate, not allowed to eat roast duck, uh, not allowed to eat char siu, okay? Not allowed to eat steak. They say, okay, there's a diet, but what do you do? You will secretly go and buy a packet of sweets when nobody wants, when nobody's looking at you, you eat. Yeah? You will not eat roast duck here, but you will fly to the UK where nobody's around and you have your roast duck and then you come back. Yeah? You will find every way to, to, to want to do those things. You just find it hard to give up because you love it. To be honest, sin, we don't hate sin, right? To be honest, we are attracted to sin. We love sin. Sin is so pleasurable. Isn't that right? Otherwise, we wouldn't be doing them. All these wrong things that we shouldn't do, it is so nice. So now, let me encourage you today. How do we increase our hatred of sin? How do we increase our hatred of sin? Okay. Let me give you some encouragement. Let's just turn to a book of Psalms. Okay, Psalms 97. If you have Psalm 97, just turn to me, turn with me to it, and let's look at the first few lines, okay? Look, it says, The Lord reigns. Let the earth be glad. Let the distant shore rejoices. Clouds and thick darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Fire goes before him and consumes his foe on every side. His lightning lights up the world, the earth sees and trample. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. The heaven proclaims his righteousness, and all the people see his glory. What do we see in a, something like a, a, a passage like this? You go back and read it, and I encourage you. What you see here is the nature of God. How he is a God of righteousness how he loves righteousness, how his wrath and his hatred is for sin. You see, this is your first secret of learning how to hate sin. And learning how to hate sin, the first step is to get to know God. Get to know God better. I'll give you an example. I'm from Hong Kong. Some of you know I'm from Hong Kong. And you know Hong Kong people, our diet is Cantonese food. And some of you already realize that Cantonese food is very plain and not very spicy. So, 30 years ago, I cannot eat hot food. I, don't, I didn't like hot food. Okay? But what happens is that God gave me a wife that comes from Malaysia whose diet is very, 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 very hot food. So what happens? That as we get to know each other, what happens? We begin to influence each other. Our lives begin to come together, and what she likes, I begin to like. And of course, what I like, she begins to like too. And so eventually, I changed. Now I can challenge you to see who can eat hotter. Who can eat more spicier. Okay? This is the same as with God. As we get to know God, as we spend our time, that's why I say, why do we spend time with God? Why do we pray? Why do we come to worship? As you spend time with God, you begin to realize what God is like. And as you begin to fall in love with God, your life begins to change. What He hates, you begin to hate. What He loves, you begin to love. It's not just spicy food that is changing me. Some of you know. There is a trend amongst 
Simo and other of her friends nowadays to eat durian, lauli. I used to hate it. I used to get sick when I smell it. Now at least I can smell it. And who knows, after a few years, I may start eating it. And when I get older, I might even love it. I don't know. But that's the way we are as we relate to each other and influence. As we relate to God, it's the same thing. What you hate now, maybe you hate righteousness now. What you love now, maybe you love sin. But as you relate to God, who hates sins and loves righteousness, our lives, as we fall in love with Him, our lives get changed. So do you hear what I'm saying? For us to be passionate with God, we have to hate sin. We have to love God, love righteousness, love what is just. And to do that, we get to know. There are other things that we can do too. Apart from getting to know God and let God influence you, there are things that we can remember. And, and part of communion is to remember that. The Bible tells us the consequences of sin. The wrath of God. The wages of sin is death, says in the Bible. Do you remember that? Do you remember how bad sin's punishment is supposed to be? We have been saved from that. We've been saved from that. So let us not forget that we have been saved from a terrible judgment. Let us not forget the terrible judgment. Let us not forget that without God, our lives would be in ruins. We would be destined for hell. Let's not forget that. Okay. As we relate to God, as we uh, not forget the penalties and the sufferings that sin will cause, one final thing before we get ourselves ready for communion. One more thing that you have to remember, that we are Christians, that we have God and His Spirit in us. What does that mean? That means that whatever we do, God is experiencing it. When you choose to act in a sinful manner, you are grieving the Holy Spirit that is in you. When you do something bad, the consequences on your life and the Holy Spirit inside you, God inside us. Okay. Don't forget, God is with us all the time. Let that be a reminder. We can't get away with things. We can't hide and eat our sweets and think that nobody realizes, nobody will know. Okay? God knows because He's around us. He's all around us. He's in us. Okay? So get to know our God. Okay, remember the consequences of sin and realize that God is with us all the time. And as we do that, we learn to hate sin. We learn to be grateful, to love the new life that God is promising us. And so with that kind of passion, we enter. And all that is made possible because Christ has opened the way for us. It's possible for us to escape from, from the consequence of sins because Christ died for us. It is possible for us to enjoy the presence of God and to know Him because the way has been opened by Christ's death on the cross. So communion is to remember what Christ has done for us and what has Christ has done to allow us to live the life that we are to live. So let this word of God encourage us. Let us look to God, His Spirit, and the help that he has promised us. And in these final moments, let's be ready for communion. The communion is open to all believers who have been baptized. So if you're a Christian today, it doesn't matter where you come from, what church background you are from. If you're a Christian and you say God is your Savior, Christ is your Savior, God is your God, you're welcome to join in communion, but you have to be baptized. So you Christian, you are baptized. If you are not a Christian and you haven't been baptized, don't be embarrassed. There will be the time when you're ready. So take that time to stay at your seats, to worship God, to listen to the songs, to think about your decision. 
The ushers in a minute will give you instructions as to how we come out orderly to take our communion. So if you're a Christian, if you have been baptized, let's prepare our hearts for communion. Amen. Thank you. Just hold the cup and the bread in your presence and pray as we wait for everybody and then we will pray and partake of the communion together. Let us pray On the night that he was betrayed Christ took the bread Broke it and gave thanks He said this is my body broken for you Take it and eat it As often as you can in remembrance of me In the same way after supper he took the cup He says this is the cup of the new covenant The blood that is shed for you Take it and drink it as often as you do in remembrance of me. For we do this to proclaim his death until he returns. We do this in remembrance of what Christ has done for us and what he has done in our lives. The broken bread 
signifies the broken body of Christ, broken to make us whole. As we take it, we take it with faith and thanksgiving that our body, soul, and spirit will be restored and healed. Let us take of the bread together. In the same way, he took the cup and said, this is the blood of his new covenant. We give thanks to God for the blood that cleanses our sins, the forgiveness of our sins, that we may have a new life. Let us receive it with thanksgiving. Let us drink of the cup together. For as we drink it and eat it, we do so in remembrance of Him and to proclaim what He has done for us until He returns. Let us proclaim also with our lives what He has done for us until He returns. Let us continue to respond to God as we collect the cups. stand
out as free people, go out as rescued people, free to live the life that God wants you to live, free to live the life that is rescued and different from the rest of the sinful world. Go in the strength of God, go in His love, to be the persons that God wants you to become. Go and bring glory to Him and to bring blessings to others. In the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, in the love of our Father God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with each one of you this day, this week, and always. God bless you all.